God gives authority to men, not so that they can lord it over and get things for themselves and and grab things for themselves. You are given authority so that your skill and your talent and your ability might be exercised for the good and blessing of those that are under you. Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth to accomplish the Father's will. People often abuse authority, but our Lord did the opposite. He used His authority to help and love others. Can we do less as a church? Hello, I'm Bill Wright, and we're glad you've joined us for The Truth Pulpit with Don Green, founding pastor of Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Don is continuing our series in the book of Philemon, titled, Charge That to My Account. Don, what's the key to using authority wisely? Well, my friend, I think the key to having authority and using it well is to remember the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who used his authority as the Son of God to step into the world and bring salvation as a service to those who would believe in him. What you need to do with authority is to remember that you're going to give an account to God who gave you that authority in the first place, and that will keep you from abusing it. And also remember that God has given you authority so that you could bless and protect others who are under your authority. God bless you as you seek to be a noble Christian. Thanks, Don. And friend, have your Bible open to Philemon 8 as we join our teacher now in The Truth Pulpit. We've often commented from our pulpit that it is the, the desire of many churches to, to try to make their services seem as much like the world as they possibly can so that people feel comfortable when they, when they walk into the service and they can feel like it's not that big of a transition from, from where they're at to what they're trying to lead people into. I'm not going to engage in a big polemic about that here this morning. I've done that in the past plenty of times. But I want to point something out to you that nothing could be further from the way that things ought to be. It it gives an entirely wrong view of God, a wrong view of Christ, and a wrong view of the church, and a wrong view of the gospel to talk and act that way and and to conduct a supposed ministry in that way. You see, the truth of the matter is that, that Christ has made it very plain that, that who He is and the way that He thinks and what He does is completely contrary to the spirit of the world. And so it is important for us to recognize the difference in the spirit of Christ, the difference in the, in the nature of God from what the world does. And that, that has just massive implications for everything. It has massive implications for the way that you think about Christ. It has massive implications for the way that you respond to the gospel, for the way that you conduct the church. And it has massive implications for the way that you respond in personal relationships, as we're going to see here in this morning. To know Christ, beloved, is to know a spirit is to know a disposition of character that is completely contrary to the spirit of the world. And I want to have you turn to the book of Matthew. This is only by way of introduction. In verse 25, Matthew 20, Jesus called the disciples to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. As you read that text, you, it helps to do a little bit of reverse engineering on it. Christ is setting himself up as, as the standard and the pattern by which his disciples would live. And what he's saying is, is that I, as the, the Son of Man, as the eternal Son of God, as the Savior, as the Messiah, you must understand why I am here on earth. He said, I didn't come in order that lesser beings would serve me. He said, I came to serve them and to give my life a ransom for many. And he goes from there, again, working the passage that I just read backwards, saying, 
Therefore, if you're going to be my disciple, then a like spirit would animate you as well. You see, Christ used his authority to serve his Father and to serve his people. He used his position of of power and might and righteousness and grace in order to give his life as that ransom payment that would release sinners from their sin and to save them from judgment. Beloved, this is really, really big. (laughs) Um, Even though the truths we're talking about here are really familiar in one sense, we're, we're, we're tapping into the way that Christ handled the authority that was His. And what He did was, rather than asserting His rights as King and compelling obedience, He took that position to serve with His own obedience and sacrificial death. Well, that means something for you and me. As we come to Christ in repentance and faith, 1 John 2, 6 says, we ought to walk in the same manner as He Himself walked. You see, what we're, what we're talking about here is a, a complete reversal, a complete separation from the way that the world thinks about authority. And in the midst of a presidential election season, nothing could be more obvious as, as people are grasping for authority and willing to pay any price of lies and, and misleading statements in order to grasp it, in order to exercise authority over people. By contrast, here we are under true righteous authority, the righteous true authority of Christ, finding that He doesn't deal with authority that way at all. He doesn't deal with authority like the Gentiles do and lord it over them. Those, all of those thoughts help prepare us for an unexpectedly important text for us as we go back to our study of the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, which is just before the book of Hebrews in your Bible, I invite you to turn there. We took a one-week break last week for communion, and now we return to our verse-by-verse study of Philemon here this morning. And you're going to see the Apostle Paul reflecting that spirit of using authority in a spirit of love in the text that is before us today. And we'll go through a text and draw some application for ourselves at the end. We're in Philemon verse 8. Look at verses 8 through 11, which will be our text for us this morning. We'll explain some context for those that weren't with us. Verse 8, Philemon verse 8. The Apostle Paul, writing to Philemon, said, Therefore, although I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I'll be honest, I had planned to go much further in the text than that this morning, but I just needed to kind of pause and and slow down a little bit for the sake of what I wanted to say here this morning. I think if we had hurried through, we would have missed some vital things. What's happening in the letter of Philemon is this. As we've said in the past, Paul is writing a letter to a Christian man of some means named Philemon. And in that day and age, slavery was an accepted institution in society. And Philemon at one time had a slave named Onesimus, who apparently had stolen from him and then run away. And so Onesimus had wronged him, and Philemon was uh, in a position of of having been wronged and had, a, had authority to punish Onesimus, and yet his slave was gone and escaped. And for all that Philemon knew at that time, you know, this was, he was gone for good. Well, while Onesimus was away and had fled to Rome, somehow he met up with the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul led him to saving faith in Christ, led him to repentance and faith in Christ. And one of the outworkings of true repentance, one of the outworkings 
of genuine faith is that that repentance brings forth fruit. And one of the things that repentance does is it makes restitution where it has done wrong in the past, if that's possible to do. And so here is Onesimus with, physically with the Apostle Paul. He's been serving Paul for a period of time, and they have developed a close personal relationship. Look with, if you will, at verse 12 with me. Paul, speaking about Onesimus, says, I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me. And so Paul had developed this close relationship with a man that he had led to Christ. And Onesimus was serving Paul in practical ways in his imprisonment. And so there was this wonderful relationship of affection and service that was in place. But there was a problem. Things weren't right in Onesimus' life. There was this whole matter of the way that he had wronged his prior master, Philemon, and he needed to go back and make things right. Now, here's the problem. It's kind of a complex problem in one sense. If Onesimus just went back on his own, Philemon not knowing anything about his conversion, Philemon might have treated him differently, treated him according to the standards of the way the the world dealt with slaves rather than dealing with him as a Christian brother. And so as we said, what Paul did was he wrote this letter that Onesimus would take with him and would be delivered to Philemon, and and it's Paul reintroducing Onesimus to his master and saying, here's the situation I ask you to do something in response that we'll look at either this week or in coming weeks. Before Paul got to the request that he wanted to make, as we've seen in the past, he expresses his love and his affirmation of Philemon. Look at verse 7 there, which is just prior to our text for this morning. Paul, writing to Philemon, says, I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And so just kind of reacquainting ourselves with the context, Paul writes to Philemon and says, I appreciate you. You are a godly man. I know your faith in Christ. You have shown love to the saints. You have shown love to me. I am so grateful to God for who you are. That's by way of introduction before he gets to talking about the situation with Onesimus. Now, with all of that in mind, go to verse 8. Now, as we step into the body of the letter here and see what's going on, Paul says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, therefore being a word that that builds a bridge from what has just been said into what he is going to say. And what he's saying is this. He says, because you are the kind of man that you are, Philemon, because of your character of love, your proven Christian sanctification, I'm going to deal with you differently than what I might be able to do as an apostle. Paul, remember, is writing as an apostle of Christ. That means that he had a unique role of authority in the church. In fact, if you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was not afraid to assert his authority when the occasion warranted it. And in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, I just want to remind you of the authority that Paul held in his hand as the appointed representative of Christ to the church. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, Paul says, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. He says, I write to you with the authority of Christ when I speak. And in the messed up situation at the church in Corinth, he needed to assert his authority, and he did so unashamedly. But when he's talking to Philemon, it's a different situation. 
a different matter. He's dealing with a different kind of man. He's dealing with a man of proven love and character. And so what does Paul do? Notice this. This is really crucial to the whole spirit of the letter. Paul says, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper. I can give you a command as an apostle of Christ and compel your obedience in what I'm about to say. I have that confidence. I have open, candid, bold authority, and I could do this if I wished. And that would just take care of the matter based on a command. And yet, Paul says, I'm not going to do that. He restrains himself as he uses his authority. As he has authority, he restrains it. He doesn't assert himself. He doesn't compel simply because he can. He does something different. Instead, recognizing the proven Christian character of the man that he's writing to, he says, I'm going to ask you instead. I'm going to appeal to you instead. And so look at what he says in verse 8 and 9. There he says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, I can lay out for you exactly what the right and fitting thing is for you to do here, Philemon, and tell you to do it, but I'm not going to deal with you that way. Why? Because you're my brother. Why? Because I respect you, because I appreciate you, because I love you. And, and when it comes to Christian love, we don't deal with each other that way in the context of these loving, trusting relationships that are healthy in Christ. And so he says in verse 9, I'm going to deal with it differently. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm going to appeal to you. Remember who I am. Remember who it is that's writing to you. I'm an old man. Paul is probably maybe 60 by this time, which doesn't sound too old by our standards. But his body was bearing the weight of the years of suffering for Christ in ministry. Shipwreck, five times beaten with stripes, all manner, all manner of suffering in addition to the pressure that was on him from the oversight of the churches. And so Paul writes to him and says, I'm an old man that's writing to you here. And, and I'm in prison. Remember that I'm in prison for Christ. And so from this position, while I have authority, I write from this position of human weakness, and I'm going to appeal to you based on the love that I know is present in your heart. Now, beloved, let's stop and just pause for a moment and think about ourselves, about our own lives, and, and the way that we deal with each other in the context of the body of Christ. Let's do that, okay? Sure. We'll do that. You're just like me in that you bristle if somebody comes and just tries to arbitrarily, directly command you to do something without any consideration for what your thoughts or feelings are about it, don't you? You're like that. You like to be, you like to be approached, especially within the church, with a, with a measure of, of sympathy, that there's a spirit of love and concern and, and uh, recognition that goes on. Paul understood that the human heart was like that, that in the context of, of friendship, friends don't just go and start compelling and commanding each other to do things. That's, that's contrary to trust. That's contrary to love. That's, that's not consistent with the nature of the relationship that we say and that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. We share a common bond. We have a common Savior, common Lord, common faith. Paul says, I could command you, but in light of everything that I know about you, in light of the way that Christians deal with one another, I don't want to go that route. And so instead, he, he asks where he could command and as he mentions his conditions there in verse 9, of the person of Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Christ, he, he's recognizing that Philemon's natural love, his, his sanctified Christian character, and his sympathy for Paul as one who led Philemon to Christ and who is suffering for the gospel, he knows that the inclination of Philemon's heart is going to be to do whatever Paul asks him to do anyway. 
And so rather than just stepping in like a bull in a china shop and saying, this is what you must do, Paul steps back from his authority, doesn't lord it over Philemon, but rather deals with him on a horizontal relationship as a peer almost in what he asks rather than giving him a command as a superior. So look at verse 10 here. We're just kind of walking through the text together. Paul says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Notice twice, he he says, I appeal to you. I'm asking you here. In verse 9, he says, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Verse 10, I appeal to you. And so he's writing with this spirit of deference and with kindness that is in perfect keeping with what our Lord said in the passage that we looked at in Matthew 20. Our Lord said, we're not like the Gentiles who lord it over people. We step into a role of service. Paul here is not lording his position over Philemon, but rather appealing to him as a brother in love. He's affirmed Philemon, and now he's going to advocate on behalf of Onesimus. Look at verse 10. And notice how he identifies with Onesimus. The sweetness of the love that he has for this fugitive slave. Look at verse 10 with me. He says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. My child, it's a term of of endearment. Paul speaks this way about his converts. He spoke this way about the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4. He spoke of Timothy this way. He spoke of Titus this way. There is this affection that Paul had toward those that had come to Christ under his ministry. And he, now he says, I have the same affection for Onesimus. Do you see the love that is wound up in Paul's character? Do you see the tender sympathy, the kindness, the gentleness in this man who has authority to command this kindness toward Philemon? Brother, I love you and I appreciate you. This kindness toward Onesimus, oh, this is my child. I gave birth to him in prison. You start to see a practical illustration. You see the the blinds, the drapes pulled back, and see a window into what tender Christian pastoral affection looks like. You see an outworking of it. Christ said, in principle, this is how you shall be. You shall not lord it over. Paul here has obviously imbibed that, embraced it. It, It's now woven in his character, and it just bleeds out in his dealings with everyone. Well, beloved, this isn't just in the church. This is you and your family. This is you as a man and your family, considering how these principles of authority and love interplay as as, as you deal with your wife, as you deal with your children as you deal with people in the workplace that are under your authority. We've talked about this so many times. And I'll say it again. God gives authority to men, not so that they can lord it over and get things for themselves and and grab things for themselves. You are given authority, whether in a political realm, in a spiritual realm, in an economic realm, you are given authority so that your skill and your talent and your ability and your, your control over a situation might be exercised for the good and blessing of those that are under you. This is a completely radically different counter-cultural way of thinking about the way that you hold your position that you have in life. And so for you men who have roles in your family or roles in business or roles in other area, roles in the church, this shapes the way that we handle all of that. For you young people that are coming up in life and, not, and thinking about what you want to be, this needs to be the north star of what you aim for in your character that it's in your mind that, that if, if, if God ever gives me a position of, of, of ability, of authority, of, of, of being able to, 
to direct others. I'm going to handle this in the way that Christ calls me to do. I'm not going to make this a matter of proud establishment of my person so that people bow down and kiss the ground that I walk on. My position's going to be given to me that I might be able to reflect the character of Christ and use what's given to me in a manner of serving others rather than having them serve me. Authority properly exercised is for the good of those under it, not for the enrichment or aggrandizement of the person or persons in charge. Next time on The Truth Pulpit, Pastor Don Green will wrap up the subject of authority and love as he moves further into our series, Philemon. Charge that to my account. Plan now to join us. Meanwhile, we invite you to visit our website, thetruthpulpit.com. There you can download podcasts or find out how to receive CD copies of Don's radio messages for your personal study library. And you'll also find the link Follow Don's Pulpit there. That'll take you to Don's full-length weekly sermons, not subject to the time editing we need for radio broadcasts. Once again, you'll find that all at thetruthpulpit.com. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bill Wright, and we'll see you next time for more on The Truth Pulpit with Don Green.